because design is visual, it's common for for uh, business stakeholders to say, well, you know, I'm I'm one of the users of this product. I wouldn't use it if it were like that, right? But the reality is there is no one user. Everybody's a little bit different. Um, and until you actually sit down and watch other people use your product and understand exactly what th what they're doing, your your opinion really doesn't matter nearly as much as what we actually observe and what we what we see. This is where it all begins. So say goodbye to all your fears, all your doubts. This is where they die. This is where we come to win. We come to fly. This is where we make our dreams come to life. Welcome to Innovation City. Welcome to Innovation City, a podcast featuring the innovators, disruptors, and creators who are making things happen. My name is Michael T. Johnson, and I'm here with my co-host, Tyler Kelly. Tonight, we're in Venture Cafe St. Louis. Venture Cafe is the largest gathering of innovators, entrepreneurs, creatives, disruptors anywhere in the world. So on a Thursday evening, gathered all over the globe, there are people. And uh, if you're near one of those cities, I suggest you check it out. I think you're going to love it. Uh, tonight we have Tom Griever with us. Tom, thanks you for, thank you for being on the show. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. So welcome, Tom. Tom is the UX and Design Director at Batovi. Batovi is a front-end design and development consulting company, and he's also the author of the best-selling O'Reilly book, Articulating Design Decisions. That's right. And so I think we're going to get to talk a lot about, for those who don't know, UX is user experience. Correct. And design, and that's super exciting because... We love that stuff. So yeah, it's gonna yeah. be it's gonna be a good interview. Great, well, I'm looking forward to it. Let's do yeah. it. So we hear, I mean, to start off, we hear a lot lately about um, like everybody should learn to code or like coding skills, which super important. But we don't always hear a lot about like the design aspect. So just jump us right into design, user experience design, what all that what all that stuff means and how it's applicable. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think when most people hear the word design, they think specifically about the aesthetic of how, you know, software products, you know, look. But when we talk about UX and user experience design, we're thinking a lot more about um, what the function is, right? How people use a product, um, how we can help them achieve their goals more quickly. So typically in a user experience design process, we're not just thinking about the, the look and feel, although that's certainly an important part of a person's experience. But we also want to take the time to actually observe how people use the product, um, see if there are ways that we can improve the experience or improve their efficiency. Something like task completion is critically important to most applications, right? Can we, can we help people complete their tasks faster by changing the size or color of a button or by reordering the inputs that we have on our software. So it's all about optimization and every, every business, every app has different goals that they're trying to accomplish, but ultimately we want to build towards those goals so that the user, the end user, the people using the products actually have the, the best possible experience. So, I mean, you could take that concept pretty far when you remove yourself from the web and like creating websites as well. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, things like wayfinding through a building. Um, and, you know, a lot of retail spaces have been doing this sort of thing for a long time. They don't call it UX. Um, UX is a term that was born out of Apple and has become synonymous with software for the most part. But I mean, even elements of customer experience you see too, right? How can we create that end-to-end -end experience for a customer, whether they're uh, going to our website, whether they visit one of our store locations, whether they're calling customer service, we want to be sure that that whole experience is consistent. Um, and that is helping them accomplish their goals. Very few UX designers get to be involved in that full customer experience, um, but we're seeing that more and more with a lot of people in my industry. They're, they're, they're getting to be, participate in conversations sort of outside of the software design process. So then in, in your capacity, like how do you get to interact with whatever it is the user experiences? So typically that is uh, a, all about observation. And there are a number of ways that you can do that. The most common one is to do use what we call usability testing or user testing. So we want to get a, uh, a person in a room. Sometimes it's, it's a lab. It's a kind of a formal environment. Sometimes we want to observe them use our product in context. So if it's a retail environment and we know they're going to use the app for that retail store, we want to, we want to see how they use it actually in context. But whatever the, the method, uh, the point is that we want to actually observe people use the product, um, see if they're solving uh, the problems that we w expect them to solve in the way that we expect them to solve it. And if not, we come back and we use that information to help us understand how to change the software or the product to create that better experience. 
So user experience kind of reminds me of like a real life example is I went to the bank a couple weeks ago and uh, the handles look like you're supposed to pull on them, yeah. but they had a little thing that said push under them. But human behavior is to like take that thing and pull on it, not push on it. So, I mean, you apply what you're what you're talking about to real life, and I, that feels like that's an example of the type of work that you might be doing on a website. Yeah, it's uh, it's absolutely true. And in fact, a, a push pull door handle example is perhaps one of the most common things that people interact with every single day. That is absolutely user experience design, right? Um, so we we want to design door handles that make it clear whether you're supposed to push or pull, and it's the same concept but applied to to software and product design. Yeah. So tell me about the book, Articulating Design Decisions. Is this a UX book or? Yeah, so Articulating Design Decisions um, actually was born here in St. Louis. So I live not far from here. And uh, several years ago, I was asked to speak at the St. Louis UX conference. Um, and uh, at the time, I had submitted several different kind of ideas for talks and Articulating Design Decisions was one of them. Uh, at the time, it was kind of my least favorite of the conference talks that I wanted to give. Um, but that's, of course, the one that they picked. Uh, so then I was tasked with coming up with like, you know, the rest of the content around this talk. But the, the synopsis for the talk was basically that at designers... You know, there, there was a time in, in, a, in a web design or even in a graphic design history where designers and businesses were sort of relegated to these special departments with special computers and they made pretty pictures and they reported typically to a marketing department, right? Um, and as user experience design has become more important to businesses designing products because, and, and as software has become a product in and of itself, um, businesses are starting to realize the, the value of having a good design at the forefront. But the challenge has been that most of those designers originally came from art schools. They don't have a business background. They don't know how to speak the language of the business. And there has often been this disconnect between what a business stakeholder wants or expects um, and what a designer expects to deliver, right? And so when it comes to getting your work approved from a, a business person, it's a completely different challenge than, say, showing it to a peer who also has kind of the same mental model of how design works, right? And so I had seen throughout my career this phenomenon where there were designers that there, were, there seemed to be some that were really successful in their jobs um, and others that weren't so. And typically it was their ability to articulate to other people why they did what they did. And when they were able to do that well, they were more likely to have their work approved. And so their work got to got to go on and live a life of its own, right? And so many designers expect to just kind of show up and pull the curtain off their designer, their, their design, their work, and have this kind of aha moment and everyone just gets it, right? <laughs> like if, if I design it right, then I'll show it to somebody and they'll just go, oh, wow, that's exactly you know what, what I want. And that's not at all the reality. And so as I started to kind of distill this into a, a, a talk for the, the conference in St. Louis, the response was, was almost overwhelming. I mean, everyone was saying, oh my gosh, I've had this experience. Oh my gosh, I've worked with so many designers. I'm like this, I'm horrible at convincing my vice president that, that my design is the right thing to do. And it evolved ultimately into a, a, a book. And it, it turns out it's really a felt need, I think, in a lot of businesses that have designers building software that we, we, ha we have a difficult time communicating to other people why we do what we do. So if I'm a designer, is it as simple as feeling like I have a reason or intention behind what I'm doing and being able to communicate that? That's certainly a, a, a step, right? And so most designers are are trained to think critically about design, right? And And through experience, they understand what works and what doesn't. So often there are these kind of underlying reasons why they did what they did, but they fail to connect the dots, right? They're, they're, they're doing it what they think is maybe based on instinct, but in reality, it's based on some best practice. It's based on an experience they had before. We, 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 I did this in a different product. I know it doesn't work, so I'm going to do it differently now. And they fail to connect those dots and then communicate them to someone else. So yeah, there's certainly an element of we just need to be intentional about knowing why we did what we did so that we can help other people understand it. Yeah. But it sounds like from what you're talking about, there's also a disconnect between a business goal and a best practice that a designer might have. Correct. Yeah. And so businesses run on KPIs. They have metrics they're, they're, they're chasing after. And designers frequently don't 
keep those top of mind when they're designing an experience, right? Um, or, or maybe it's even fair to say they don't present their work in such a way to solve that need. There's always, there's always some sort of problem that we're trying to, to solve with design, right? Um, often it's an aesthetic problem, but that's not the most important thing for the business. And, and, and we're usually trying to solve those business problems. We're trying to move those metrics. We want people to click on the button more. We want them to add to cart. We want them to check out. Um, but we don't present it that way. We, present, we, we don't explain, well, if we do this, if we use this design, uh, we have every reason to believe that it's going to improve that KPI. Designers aren't trained to think that way, typically. So talk to me about what makes a good UX designer because it's a high it's I would I would say highly specialized in that it's not just the design but maybe also like the psychology and knowing how you people use things that's right and then maybe the testing capability of being able to watch how people use them so there's like all these different skill sets that combine to create a UX designer. So talk to me about that. Absolutely. And in an ideal situation, you can specialize in those areas, right? So you might have someone who focuses exclusively on research and maybe they're trained in human behavior and psychology and they're, 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 they're more capable to write test questions that aren't biased in order to, to get the results that, that, that we expect. Right. Um, and in and another specialization that is the visual design, right? It's the UI, it's the polish, it's it's making the a really you know good looking design. Uh, another specialization within UX is interaction design, right? When I click the button, what happens? It plays this animation. Something cool happens. It makes me feel good. I get I elicit an, an emotional response, right? Um, and all of these are are different parts and pieces of user experience. But right now, the where our industry is, for the most part, you have a lot of designers that are sort of expected to maybe fill all of those roles in some ways. And so there's no doubt that it's a, it's a big challenge. You mentioned everyone should learn to code earlier. Designers hear that every day, um, that they should learn to code. And so now not only are we expected to do research and UI design and interaction design, but we also have to code too. Um, and not, not very many people can do that. There are, there are some, um, but uh, there's certainly a case to be made for, for specialization and, and it's definitely more efficient. But I, 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 think, I think the key point though to remember is that we need to we need to know that those are all the parts and pieces because too often you do have a designer that is only focused maybe on the the the, the functionality and not on the the interface design right and then you might have someone who's really good at visual design but it turns out the experience they created is hard to use it looks cool um, and I mean how many times have you had that experience probably right where you have an app on your phone it's like wow this this looks really cool but I have no idea how to use it right and that's common too. So if I'm a if I'm a business owner I, or I'm the person that's kind of I'm the one that's hiring the designer, what can I do to make sure that I communicate my goals, my business objectives, in a way that that I get like the best relationship out of my the creative or the UX people or, or any of those people that I'm working with? Yeah. So I mean, if we're talking about the book, it's the I, I wrote chapter twelve in the book specifically for non-designer, non-designer stakeholders. So that, that chapter could literally just kind of like be ripped out of the book and given to like the CEO or the founder of the company because it was written specifically with that in mind. And there are kind of a number of, of suggestions, but I think the, the most important thing and the, the, the thing that I experienced the most when working with other people is that, is that often there is, because design is, because design is visual, right? At the, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a visual medium. Um, People, people being business stakeholders, believe that because they have an opinion about design, they, they know what they think looks good or doesn't look good or works well or doesn't work well, that that means that their opinion is just as valid as that of the expert now that they've hired, right? Um, the same way that we can choose the kind of music that we like, right? But that doesn't make us a good musician, does it? And I, 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 I wished more business stakeholders valued the expertise that we bring to the table, trusted us a little bit more to make recommendations, maybe even if they disagree. Um, it's common for, for uh, business stakeholders to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm one of the users of this product. I wouldn't use it if it were like that, right? But the reality is there is no one user. Everybody's a little bit different. 
Um, and until you actually sit down and watch other people use your product and understand exactly what, th what they're doing, your, your opinion really doesn't matter all that much. It doesn't matter nearly as much as what we actually observe and what we, what we see people using. So. Now, what if you turn the tables the other way, the, the people doing the work, what, what can they do to communicate better to the stakeholders on the business end? Yeah. So it's, I mean, it, in, in some ways it's a, it's a balancing act, right? On the, on the one hand, we have uh, designers who have expertise in design. And on the other hand, we have business stakeholders who have valuable domain knowledge. They have some information about the business or the market that, that we don't have. And our job is to figure out how to, to bridge that gap and kind of make that, that disconnect. I think um, anytime we can focus as much as possible on the goals, like we talked about earlier, what problem are we trying to solve? Um, and if I can communicate how this is going to solve that problem, then I'm going to stand a much better chance at convincing someone that my decision is the right way to go. Um, another one is is to address how it's better than the alternative. If I can tell someone, okay, you know, this is my recommendation. There's 10 other ways we could do it, right? But I know why my recommendation is better than those 10. Because what happens is you end up in a room with a, a, a business stakeholder who's like, well, why don't we put a monkey on it, right? And unless I've tried that, unless I know why that that alternative isn't going to work, then I'm not going to be able to defend that. I'm going to have to go back and be like, okay, yeah, I'll try it. I'll put the monkey on it. I'll get back to you next week. Right? So that's another thing. That so we have to know what problem does it solve? Why is it better than the alternative? And then the last one, which deals a lot more with user experience is how's it going to affect the user? Like what, what is this going to do for that end user? Because at the end of the day, we, re, we want to be sure that, that what we're creating is not only going to solve the business problems, but it's also going to be a positive experience for the user. So I was just going to say, like, what what you're suggesting is, is challenging because a lot of times we just get in a routine of just doing yeah. best practices. And, right. and I think, like you mentioned earlier, maybe not knowing why it's a best practice, but just knowing that it is. And so for designers, really, it's about not just doing the best practice, but understanding why it's a best practice. That, that's right. I, I think it's recognizing that as designers, our job is much more than just creating um, design assets. And I think too often that's what we, you know, we're, we're here to deliver something that, that we'll put on an app. And the, and the reality is uh, we probably end up spending as much or more of our time just talking to people about our work as we do actually creating the work itself. Um, and I, I think the sooner you can kind of wrap your mind around the fact that communicating my designs to someone else is probably more important than the design itself. And it is when you think about it, because if I can't, if I can't convince you that my design is the right thing to do, then it'll never see the light of day. I'll, I'll never, it'll never have the opportunity to go out and change the lives of the people that I say I care so much about, right? And so in that sense, it doesn't, my design is less important than my ability to communicate about my design. And we, I, we, we designers stay so focused on creating the right thing and doing the right thing and making sure our wireframes are ready or making sure we have the data that we want. And we need to take the time to, I don't know, practice, take notes, jot down why we did what we did, talk to our colleagues and make sure that we're on the, you know, on the right track. Those things are vitally important to being able to communicate in a business. So let's uh, shift gears a little bit and talk more about kind of like career path. And you ended up writing a book, you speaking at conferences, things like that. So yeah. um, if I'm working in that industry or I'm a designer in some way and, and I want to elevate my game or be more influential or, you know, follow a similar path to what you're, you're taking, what do I, what do I do? I, I mean, like I said earlier, I think that some of the more successful designers I've seen are the ones that are that are more articulate. Um, because if you can't articulate your design decisions, then that you, I mean, you could might as well just like stay home that day, right? Because it's not going to have any effect. And so I think the I, I think prioritizing that and practicing that. Um, people frequently ask me, you know, well, how can I get better at articulating design decisions? Um, writing it down is super important. Um, how would you express your work to someone else if you didn't have the benefit of showing them a visual asset, if you were only going to verbally tell them or if you're going to communicate, you know, only by email? Um, sometimes the process of just writing things down, it, it it's a different medium. 
uh, different than the medium we normally work in. And it, it triggers things that you didn't even realize were there, right? If you can ask yourself questions about your, your work, what problem does it solve? Why is it better than the alternative? How does this affect the user? If I can answer those questions to myself first, I'll be much better at doing it with other people. And then, yeah, and then just, you know, practicing. Um, yeah, go, speaking at a conference, uh, going to, to meetups and, and speaking, I've encouraged people to join uh, Toastmasters, which is a, an organization that allows people to kind of practice public speaking. I think some, sometimes people are just nervous about what, you know, what it would mean to, to speak up and communicate their, their thoughts. Some of, the, some of the best designers in the industry are the most articulate, well-spoken, um, simply because they can get their message across and get their work approved, right? There, there are some really, really talented designers whose work we'll never see. Um, because they're not in an environment in which they're able to communicate and express their work so that it'll get approved and go out there. Well, the million dollar question is where can we get the book? I mean, obviously it's going to be on Amazon, but the question is where can people connect with you and how can they purchase a book? Yeah, I, yeah, the book's on Amazon. Uh, it's an O'Reilly book, so it's available pretty much anywhere. Barnes and Noble has them too. Um, Amazon usually has the cheapest price. There's an ebook. There's a video course that I did too. So if you have a team, and your team is interested in discussing the book or doing it together, there's a. I did a video course through O'Reilly. You can purchase that also on Amazon or from O'Reilly. I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn, and and you can send me an email from through my website. I I mean I enjoy hearing from people and. Uh, it's it's a problem that I, I am passionate about helping people solve, and I've talked to lots of companies and people all over the world about it, and it's it's been a fascinating journey to see how many other people struggle with this, but it's also been really rewarding to know that we're all in it together, and we can help each other be better at this this thing that we need to succeed. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to get a copy of the book. I am not necessarily a designer. But we work with designers, so yeah. it would be a good gift, I think. It would, yeah. It would be an excellent <laughs> yeah. gift. Yeah. Well, Tom, thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, sharing your knowledge, and we appreciate you being on the show. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, Tom. For more episodes, visit innovationcity.co. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review. And if you're in St. Louis, visit us on a Thursday night. Details at vincafstl.org. And connect with us on social at We Are Slam or at Venture Cafe STL. Thanks for listening. This is where it all begins. So think about-